My name is Josh said is Dana Little, by the way, and I work with the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. And if you don't know, we're a public agency. Um, our region is four counties. It's Palm Beach, Martin, St. Lucie, and Indian River County. We're not a government, but what we do is we provide technical assistance to government. So we've been working with Martin County for, gosh, 25 years on various things. Um, our office is in Stewart, and um, we were actually worked with the CRAs when they were established way back in 2000. Um, at the time, and until recently, there were seven CRAs. Uh, Rio, Hope Sound, Jensen Beach, Port Salerno, Old Palm City, um, Golden Gate, and then Indian Town, which of course has incorporated, so the county still has six CRAs left, which is actually very unique for a county to have that many distinct historical areas, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. Part of the reason that the CRAs were created one of the reasons is that they do have a distinct character. They are typically the historic parts of Martin County. And when they were established back in 2000, they had been kind of run down. So it was a way to, to reinvigorate and promote redevelopment and um, investment in the CRAs. So what I'm going to try to do is in the next few minutes walk you through the dizzying world of land use planning and uh, zoning in Martin County, but I'll try to make it pretty straightforward. Um, as I mentioned, um, well, I didn't mention this. So we have worked with the CRAs in Martin County since they were established in 2000. Various, you know, assisting Rio with this or assisting Jensen Beach with that. And when the CRAs were established back then, each of the CRAs developed a vision plan. Who do we want to be as we grow up and as we redevelop and as we invest? Um, how do we maintain our historic character? How do, we, how do we enhance our historic character? These are some of the things that we heard in the CRAs back then, and those visions, in fact, are still intact. Um, however, the rules, though, the codes to implement those visions have been developed over time by different hands, um, some would say that they were intentionally made confusing along the way. Um, I don't know why, but, um, you know, and so what's happened is that it's become, very, it's become very difficult to understand what the rules really are in the CRAs. Uh, when we talk to folks that have properties, often we'll ask them, you know, what can you do on your property? And oftentimes we'll hear, we're not really sure. You know, we'll go to the county one day and ask, and we get one answer, and then we go to the county another day, and we talk to somebody else, and we get another answer. <laughs> and it's not that the people at the county don't know what they're doing. It's that the rules are so unclear that even county staff has a hard time understanding. I do this for a living. This is one of the most difficult projects we've ever worked on. Um, and I'll start to explain to you why. We started this back in August 18th, excuse me, August of 2018. Uh, this is a two-year effort, and I'll give you some idea of where we are. We've, over, since August of 2018, we've conducted over 27 public meetings, 14 of which have been night meetings. We're trying to make sure that we're doing daytime and nighttime meetings. Uh, for each of the CRAs, we meet with the NACs twice. I'll be back here in a month or so, you'll see in a minute, um, where we've taken your input, we freshened up the code, and then we're going to present the recommendations. Tonight's just an overview to sort of wet your whistle about what it is we're up to. We've also conducted over 80 individual one-hour interviews with folks like yourselves. Um, as we start each of the CRAs, we, we like to interview each of the NAC members, uh, property owners, regular citizens, folks that are just interested or concerned about what this effort is, honestly. So this is our schedule. You probably can't see this. But this is, this is the order in which we, have, we, are, we are developing this whole effort. Uh, Jensen Beach, Rio, both are adopted at this point. Um, Old Palm City, sorry, I don't mean to wiggle this. Old Palm City, we're going for final adoption next Tuesday for second reading at the Board of County Commissioners. Hope Sound, we are going back to the NAC. We'll see in a minute, um, in, uh, in a few weeks. And this is where we are in terms of the total time frame. We're actually on track, believe it or not, um, considering that 
When we started this, we didn't realize that we would also have to be getting into the comprehensive plan in Martin County and revising that as well. And if you know anything about the comprehensive plan in Martin County, it's sort of a sacred cow, if you will. Um, but what we discovered is that there were things embedded in the comprehensive plan that were actually prohibiting or preventing the CRAs from implementing their vision. So I'll talk about that a little bit further in a moment. So here we are, February 13th. Um, this is Port Salerno, of course. Uh, this is the, our first NAC meeting here, which is the 13th. We're scheduled to come back on April 16th. At that time, we'll be presenting to you what our specific recommendations are going to be. Uh, we are still working on this. This effort in Port Salerno is not baked yet. Um, we are still doing lot by lot analyses. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but one of the things that is very challenging for this effort, and I'm not complaining, but I'm just telling you, we are, doing, we are taking this very seriously, is that every single piece of property within Martin County already has existing development rights. You may be allowed to do a single family house, you may be allowed to do a business, you may be allowed to do a boat yarn, oh, excuse me, a boat barn. Um, so we have to take that into consideration. We have two real mantras in this effort. Number one is that our goal is not to take anybody's property rights. That is not what this is about. In fact, I should have mentioned um, Susan Kors from the CRA is here, Josh, of course, Jana from the CRA, Irene Settlemeyer from, from uh, Growth Management. We have a team of not only us at Treasure Coast, but the CRA, Growth Management Department, the Engineering Department, and the Legal Department, which is critical in this effort because they are keeping us you know, within the guardrails of legal sufficiency. We are not interested in taking away anybody's property rights. At the same time, this effort is not an effort to gift anybody lots of additional height or density or anything of that nature. If you don't already know, in Martin County, the comprehensive plan limits the absolute maximum residential density allowable in Martin County at 15 units per acre. That is not changing. In Martin County, the absolute maximum building height is four stories or 40 feet. That also is not changing. However, in some cases, and as we go through this lot by lot analyses, um, we find some inconsistencies. I'll give you an example. Map Road in um, Old Palm City. All of Old Palm City is allowed to do three stories, except for Map Road. It was only allowed to do two stories. We don't know why. That's their main street. That's what they're intending for it to be. They're investing tens of millions of dollars to turn it into that. And so we had a conversation with the NAC. We said, look, we honestly think that you should be able to go to three stories on Map Road. And they agreed. And then we presented that to the local planning agency and to the CRA board. And then to the Board of County Commissioners, and so far everybody has kind of agreed. That made sense. But there is no sort of secret you know, development um, prize embedded in this effort at all. When the CRAs were created, um, there were existing rules on the books. There were existing future land use categories and there were existing zoning. Um, in order to achieve some of the mixed use goals and some of the more <laughs> compact and intense development that the CRAs were interested in, rather than doing wholesale rezonings, overlays were created for both the comprehensive plan and the zoning code. Let me step back for a second. Um, this is kind of like planning 101, forgive me, but there are two primary documents that govern growth and development within your county. One is the comprehensive plan and what's called the future land use designations and all of that language in there, that's where your absolute maximum cap density is established. That is planning at a level of about 15,000 feet for Martin County. Residential of this type is good over here and commercial of that type is good over there. The second document that rules are what's called the land development regulations, your zoning code. That gets down to the pedestrian level and says, you know, you must have a setback of five feet. You must be able to park so many cars. Your driveway must be made of a certain material. So those two documents are supposed to be in absolute consistency with one another. 
as I mentioned earlier, we discovered that there were things, there were, we knew kind of where we wanted to go. The vision's been in place for the CRAs for 20 years, and they haven't been implemented. Um, what we discovered is that those two documents, the comp plan and the vision and the LDRs, weren't always in sync. And in fact, they were kind of beating up on one another. So one of the things that, one of the first things we decided, which is why we had to get into the comprehensive plan, is that we want to do away with these overlays. Because I've got zoning and I've got future land use, but I've got a, an overlay on my future land use and I've got an overlay on my zoning, it's like four dimensional chess. It's hard to tell exactly what you can do. If I've got a commercial future land use and I want to do residential, I can do it if I'm in the mixed use overlay, um, so long as my zoning is a certain way. You know, it's just, it's very squirrely. Um, and then what's happened too over time is that the boundaries didn't align and things like that. So what we did is establish a new chapter in the comprehensive plan that I'll talk about in just a second that eliminates these overlays. That makes it very clear what you can do, what an investor can do. It makes it very clear for staff so that they can answer your questions. And then, so we're going through a county initiated rezoning of the properties as well. Each of you who owns a piece of property within the CRA is going to get a letter that says, hi, we're Martin County and we're rezoning your property for you. Um, and the point of this presentation tonight and all of the presentations going forward is to give you some assurances, I hope, that um, you're gonna come out better on the other side. Um, the rules will be more clear. You will not have gained a lot. You will not have lost anything. Um, but we believe it will also create some flexibility for what folks can do with their parcels. Um, I mentioned this is your redevelopment plan established back in 2000. It was updated in 2009. Um, as I mentioned, there are two primary, develop primary documents that control development. What we did is within the comprehensive plan, Previously, within the comprehensive plan, the CRA stuff was kind of scattered throughout the book. We said, look, we need to be clear on what it is we're doing. So we created chapter 18. Until recently, there was only 17 chapters in the comprehensive plan. Chapter 18 is dedicated to the CRAs. All of the special rules that apply to the CRAs, um, for the most part, are identified in chapter 18. Chapter 18 also enables us to have what's called Article 12 in the land development regulations, the zoning code. Up until recently, there was only 11 articles in the code. Article, tw Article 12 is the zoning code language dedicated specifically to the CRAs as well. Uh, these, were, these were adopted by the BCC back in September. <coughs> And uh, I'll just run through this quickly. So in Port Salerno, these maps on the left, and I know you can't see them very clearly, but um, these are available online, though, but that, you can, that you can look at. The CRA boundary in Port Salerno is like this. Here is, let me see, where are we? Here's, this is Salerno. There we go, right. Salerno and then Cove. And um, here's Manatee Pocket right here, of course. We are right here at the triangle. This is the old future land use map. Um, actually, the one that currently exists in Port Salerno. And there are a variety of different um, land use categories. There are different densities. This orange, this purplish stuff here is mobile home. Um, and then what happened when the CRAs were created, this yellow stuff, which is the mixed use overlay, was placed on top of it. Um, the idea was in these mixed-use overlay areas, that's where your town centery type stuff would be. You can imagine that, you know, Manatee Pocket for sure, you know, right here along um, the pocket here where the, the, the fishing industry and restaurants and stuff, that's clearly your town center, if you will, your destination. Um, Jensen Beach Boulevard and Jensen, it's the same thing. They're very different experiences, but they still have that sort of that urban destination where there are restaurants and shops and even housing and things of that nature. What we're proposing is a future land use map that sort of, com that sort of compresses some of these categories down into um, a few less. Uh, we're creating two new categories because our analysis has shown 
that really most of the CRAs, except for maybe Jensen Beach because it's so small, most of the land is really dedicated to neighborhoods. I mean, west of, of Dixie, I mean, it's virtually all residential. You know, there are little pockets of commercial here and there. Um, so what we've created are two districts, or excuse me, two new categories. CRA Center, which is reflective of the old uh, mixed-use overlay boundaries, and then CRA Neighborhood, which is all of this brown stuff in here. Those two categories, again, at a, at a level of about 15,000 feet, will enable the different sub-districts that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, I said Article 12 was also created, and I want to talk about this a little bit, um, just to give you an understanding of the organization of Article 12. Uh, this, however, is the existing zoning maps. So you have the future land use map of the comp plan, and then you have the zoning maps in the LDRs. Uh, you'll notice this is this has lots of colors in it. Um, you know, planners over the years have really broken things down by you know size of the lot or the density or very specific types of use. And what we found over time is that, especially in urban areas or areas that you want redevelopment, sometimes it's overregulation, and it's really a lot better to be simpler and more flexible for property owners and investors. Uh, what we're proposing to do is re take all of these colors for the most part and turn them into just one big one. Rezone all of Port Salerno into a new zoning category called Port Salerno CRA. Now that sounds kind of weird because you know it doesn't distinguish a lot of stuff. The blue stuff that you see here, this is public service districts, these are the schools, this is uh, the base in here, uh, Murray Middle down here. These are public facilities for the most part. And these up here, the green, the recreational district, uh, those exist and they're being carried forward. So the idea is that if you want to find out, okay, I'm, I'm looking at investing in Port Salerno, maybe I want to move to Port Salerno, but I want to know what I can do with my property. Um, you'll go to the zoning map and it'll tell you, hey, you're in the CRA zoning district. So once you go there, you'll find out, actually I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. I'm gonna jump back for a second. Um, that, will, that will send you to what's called the regulating plan. And this is where we get into the great level of detail. We have sub-districts in there. So this is a little bit more reflective of the existing zoning map. And the reason why we do this is because, number one, we need to purge your system of all of the, as much as we can, of all of the old zoning categories. There are many zoning categories that are on the ground today that you can't even use. So the thought is, let's just start from scratch. Understanding what you or you can build today and making sure that you can build that tomorrow, but we've created these new sub-districts with new rules um, that are much more clear. I'm gonna step back for just a second here. I had mentioned that Article 12, you know, the new land development regulations for the, for the CRAs. There are seven different divisions. Imagine within that chapter there are sub-chapters. Division one are the rules that apply to all of the CRAs. And I bring this up because um, your rules that are existing today, they will remain intact until this new code becomes effective if you support it. Um, each of the subsequent Divisions. Division two is Jensen Beach. Division three is Rio. Division four is Old Palm City. You get the idea. Division five is Hope Sound. Division two and division three are adopted and effective today. Um, division four, Old Palm City, is not yet adopted, nor is Hope Sound. So we couldn't do all of them at once because what we're finding is that we're learning things from place to place. Uh, we've already got a list of things we're going to go back and sort of correct when all of this is done. I, I'll cat's out of the bag. Um, you know, we're going to have our own glitch bill once we write this because we're learning things as we go along. But what we're also finding is that the rules that work in Jensen Beach don't necessarily work precisely in Old Palm City or in Port Salerno. You've got conditions here that clearly don't exist anywhere else. Uh, maybe a little bit in Rio with the waterfront. Map Road in, in Old Palm City, very different. I mentioned before that um, there are a lot of unimproved or unopened rights of way throughout, uh, throughout Port Salerno. One of the maps that we're creating that's to 
that's to um, be, um, that's to, this to work with the regulating plan is what we call the street regulating plan. And we identify what we call primary in red and secondary streets. That doesn't mean that these streets are better than others. It just means that the primary streets are probably usually the most heavily traveled. They also are often your main street, and so they are held to a higher standard in terms of, in terms of quality or development. In fact, like on primary streets, you might not be able to have a surface parking lot for the full length of your lot or something like that. Um, there are also areas where the, the, the MPO, the, excuse me, the CRA, we speak in acronyms, um, the CRA, the Community Redevelopment Agency, and the MPO, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization of Martin County, they're the road planners. They're the ones that fund a lot of the road improvements in Martin County. Uh, we're working together and they're identifying some road corridors for improvements, especially for multimodal improvements, meaning like bike, lanes, sidewalks, things like that, especially where they're needed. Um, ebb tide is an example of one of those that's being looked at at the MPO. So we've identified ebb tide as a secondary street. Not that it's subordinate to or not as good as the other streets, it's different. But it helps prioritize what some of these key links are uh, for future improvements. Within the code today, there's a whole array of uh, what they call TND or traditional neighborhood development street sections. For those of you that have never seen a street section, this is what it is. This is if you were to slice your street in half and you've got a house on one side, a little porch, a sidewalk, a tree, a street, a tree, and then hopefully a house not unlike yours on the other side. And then you see it in plan. These have been developed, there's a whole array of these that the county's developed over years. We've just kind of freshened them up and brought them forward. These are meant to be, um, not aspirational is not the right word, but informative. For instance, um, some of the CRAs are looking at, um, you know, we want to improve this street or we want to improve that street. So this provides a palette of different options ranging from wide streets all the way down to alleyways. Uh, this is actually used, this is being used already in Jensen Beach, where if you know Church Street just north of Rico, um, they're trying to get some on-street parking, and so we developed a street section that applies to that. That could be used in other places, or it may not be used in other places, but this is, this is sort of a, 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 a depository of, of, um, of street types and, um, and traditional street designs and dimensions. So, um, I mentioned that Division 1 within Article 12 applies to all of the CRAs. There's about 100, I keep getting the number wrong, but about 148 different uses that are permitted throughout the CRAs. It's a long list. Not all uses are permitted in all CRAs, or not all uses are permitted in all areas, of course. But we thought, boy, you know, we're doing six of these, We'd hate to have to copy the same five or 10 pages over and over and over again. And besides, you know, a lot of them are very similar. You know, the gift shop isn't really that much different than the card store or, you know, smaller types of retail. So we created what we call use groups based upon their impact. Um, and the idea is that we have residential use groups that all have similar impacts. We have commercial business use groups, and those are broken down too into, um, I'm going blind, forgive me, uh, general impact, extensive impact, and we've taken all of those existing uses and we've organized them in a system that allows us then to carry it forward. All of the uses that are existing, we broke them into these groups. And then now we can take all of those uses that are listed in Division One and put them into a very simple table a one-pager for Port Salerno. So that what you see here, these columns represent, this is the core subdistrict, this is the general subdistrict, and these are the use groups. So you can quickly go through and, and, and survey and see, okay, well, I'm allowed to do residential of a certain type in this area, or I'm allowed to do commercial of an extensive impact in this area, or I'm not. Um, and then if, if there's questions, you can always go back 
to you know, Division I. But the idea is that we want to have a field guide, a manual for folks that they can use in a language that's consistent from CRA to CRA so that you don't have to take a planning course to figure out what you can do with your property. Because I'll tell you, one course isn't going to be enough right now. Um, development standards. We also created a single page which helps you understand um, if I'm in the core, what is my minimum lot width? If I'm in the general, what is my allowable building heights? As I said, we've carried forward the building heights for the most part. Um, in some cases where three stories are allowed, rather than them being 35 feet, we have been able to um, get approved increasing them to 40 feet. Remain three stories, but go to 40 feet. That allows for a greater floor to ceiling height. Three stories and 35 feet is tight. And it's not really meeting some of the modern expectations of you know, greater floor to ceiling heights, nine, 10 feet, stuff like that. But again, that's a single page that, is, uh, that helps one to understand quickly what they can do, what the general rules are. Also, we are, um, as if this isn't enough, we are regulating the areas via building typologies. What that means is that some of the CRAs were already regulating the CRA development by building types. We have a vast array of building types that we've developed. Um, a shop front, a apartment building, a townhouse, um, what we call an all yard house, which is kind of like your suburban ranch, or a cottage, which is a much tighter, you know, more urban shotgun type or, or small bungalow. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But they are permitted by by, um, by sub-district as well. So for instance, the core which we talked about, which is meant to be your sort of downtown, right, your town center area, all of these different building types are permitted except an all yard house. You don't want a big ranch burger to be dropped in, you know, on Dixie and, you know, right next to the pocket. Um, same thing is industrial buildings, you know, they don't belong in your downtown. But they do belong in other areas. So we've, we've developed and these are what we're tailoring for each of the, each of the CRAs. And this is what they look like. Um, each, each building type has a page. There's an illustration. It shows you what the dimensional criteria is for building height, building placement, what are my setbacks, where does the parking have to go. Uh, it talks about where it can go and what sub-district. So this is a shop front type. Uh, this is the cottage that I mentioned. This is sort of the all yard or the sort of ranch style house. And we've got, I think, 12 or 15 of these at this point. And uh, in fact, we're, we're still creating them as we go along. When we were in Rio, we're like, hey, and actually there's a, there's a good example of this here. Um, the boat barn. Um, boat barns, especially if you're on the water, it's obviously a good and practical use. However, they may not be the best facade along your main street. Um, so what we're suggesting is that boat barns actually have a small little liner in front of them so that there are active uses at the ground level. This could be, this could be the office of the manager of the boat barn. It could be a retail space. It could be an office for something else. But the idea is that, and you have that condition here, I'm not being critical, but right over here across from, um, what's the restaurant? I, I always forget the name of it. Whistle Stop, thank you. Uh, right across from the whistle stop, there's a big boat barn right there. It's a huge metal facade. Um, the street looks so lovely, you don't really notice it as much. But you can imagine if that was set back a few feet and it had some resident, not residential, but some you know, habitable uses in front of it. Anyway, uh, this, these are being developed to address um, concerns. Now, obviously that building's not going to set back, but in Rio, there are some boat barns that are being proposed, and so this is an opportunity for staff to work with those applicants and uh, try to achieve something that's better for everybody. And then every building has a front. Some buildings have colonnades or arcades. Some buildings have shop fronts. Some buildings have porches like houses. Um, what we find sometimes is that, you know, in an effort to get as many things built or to squeeze them into a lot or whatever. There's an example up in Jensen Beach of an arcade that's only like this wide. You know, they're not adequate. So we've provided architectural dimensional criteria for some of these different, bless you, for some of these different frontage types as we call them. 
So for instance, what is a courtyard? In order to have a courtyard that's not a dangerous, dank space, there needs to be a minimum width and a maximum depth. Um, so we've provided these dimensions in here as well. OK, I'm almost done, I promise. So I've gone over you know, pretty much the guts of this. Um, I did want to highlight, though, we try to highlight some specific issues that we have identified where we are going to be recommending changes um, that are more substantial than just, you know, drawing pictures. Um, and so I want to I want to go through a few of those with you this evening. So, for instance, um, here we are. This is Salerno Road, Cove Road. Uh, this is the mobile home park that exists today. And then between Salerno and almost all the way to Cove, from Horizon West. This is the existing zoning. And all of this brown is zoned mobile home. Now we spent some time going through that area. And in fact, we spent a lot of time going through that area. And in fact, there are lots of mobile homes. But there's also a lot of site built homes as well. And there's also a lot of vacant land. And there are larger lots, etc. So we had a lot of debate about this. Um, because just looking at the zoning, this tells me that I can't build a single family house there. And we didn't think that that was necessarily the best thing for the community. Um, so what we're recommending, as I mentioned before, is that this whole area, this is the existing mobile home park. That's a different story. That's clearly a mobile home park. It's got well-defined edges. It's got the minuscule lots. They're individually owned, you know, which means that it probably has a greater lifespan than those mobile home parks that are under single ownership. So this would remain as mobile home. But what we're suggesting in the rest of the area that's currently identified as mobile home become what we call detached, or detached one. And that would allow for mobile homes to remain it would allow for mobile homes to be replaced if they're lost. But it would also allow for single family homes to be built in the community as there already are some. So think about that. Um, you know, when we get done, if there's any questions or concerns about that, you know, now's the time we'd like to hear this. We think this is a positive move. Um, what are the negative impacts? Well, the negative impacts is that, well, if I'm allowed to build single family in here, I'm going to build single family. And so we may not have a growth of mobile homes in that area. That may be a good thing. That may be a bad thing. This is a very delicate balance because affordable housing is a critical issue. And the goal of this is not to displace anybody, which is why existing mobile homes would be grandfathered in, for sure. So the, the point is, when, as we were doing our site work, you know, we know we, on one hand, we've got a map that's telling us, a zoning map that's telling us, okay, this is all mobile home, that's all that's allowed. And we're seeing a lot of, sing, or a number of single family homes that are site built. Those are non-conforming. Well, they shouldn't really be non-conforming. Maybe, and this is what we're recommending at this point, maybe you should be allowed to build single family homes in this area, um, just like you are everywhere else around there because I'm going to zoom out of this map a little bit and you'll see this purple. There's a lot of this purple and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So again, um, you can see that, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to look under every stone as we discover them. Another, um, okay, we saw this. Another um, item, and I mentioned this briefly before, um, and this is, really, this is really something that we're working with the Susan and her team and the CRA on so that this, this new code identifies areas that might be prioritized for future road improvements or future pedestrian improvements, things like that. Here's a very interesting example. I don't recall ever seeing anything quite like this, but uh, here's Murray Middle School, here's Southeast Murray Street, and then it turns here. You see as per our street map, it's identified as a secondary street, meaning it has a higher priority. It's, it's, it's an important corridor um, because it's in front of the school. Lots of kids use it, lots of bicyclists, etc. cetera. Um, so what we're identifying this as is maybe a corridor that should be prioritized for additional improvements. 
when you look at it from the ground, it's really interesting. It's a right-of-way, and maybe it looks like there are some tire tracks back here. It's hard to tell, but there's a new sidewalk. So clearly, there's a need for probably kids on the other side of, that, of these woods or whatever. Or actually, this is, a, this is a subdivision that's behind this. Um, to be able to walk to school. So I bring this up, and we've talked about it, is that maybe this, maybe this is warranted for even further improvements. We don't know. Um, and something to maybe workshop with the community at some point in the future. Should this be a new road, or is it not a road on purpose? Does it need lighting? But clearly, it's a unique condition that we wanted to bring up, um, not only to you in the NAC, but also to memorialize in this code going forward. Um, and there's lots of these type, not exactly like this, but as I mentioned before, a lot of these right-of-way type conditions that we're identifying. Um, here's something else. Now you, I think, I forget, I think it was you who, who brought this up. I've just zoomed back out a little bit, right? So we can see more of, we can see more of Port Salerno. Uh, again, here's Salerno Road, Dixie, here's Cove Road. This is that this is that mobile home area that I talked about before. It's like one, two, three, six, seven, eight. It's like 10 blocks, basically, that we're talking about. Um, all of this purple is zone R2A. That has an allowable density of eight units per acre. All of this. Now, a lot of it is single family houses. And there's a lot of new single family. In fact, we've talked with a few of the builders. There's a lot of new single family houses that are being built. There's also a lot of duplexes that exist out there. And, you know, duplexes as an investor are attractive because I obviously get more units, theoretically, right? Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that in Martin County, especially in the CRAs, you're allowed to have a single, if you have a single family lot, you're allowed to have a single family house and a accessory dwelling unit, a rental unit in the back. Um, so that's essentially the same density, if you will, plus or minus, as a duplex. The issue with duplexes is, is that it's a different building type. They're attached. They typically have fronts on the street. They usually need wider lots. So currently, um, duplexes are allowed in all of the purple. And we're not, we're not proposing to take that away at all. We have actually, as one of our building types, a duplex building type, which talks about the setbacks and all the things that I mentioned before. Um, and here's a detail of that. Um, what we have shown in the regulating plan that I pointed out before, all of the, oops, ooh, sorry, all of the light tan would go to this detached one subdistrict. That would accommodate the existing mobile homes that we just talked about. Um, duplexes, single family, um, it's a lower density type of residential scene. But still allowed to go up to eight units per acre. All of this brown is allowed up to eight units per acre. It's allowed that today, it's allowed that tomorrow. Um, the one question is, and that includes, as I mentioned, duplexes. As we've done our interviews, we've heard some some okay things and some not okay things about duplexes. I just wanted to point out that, as I mentioned, these would be the detached two, which are the more estate lots because we're following the existing pattern. But up here in the pocket, where it's all single family and there are really no duplexes up in that area, duplexes would be allowed in the future. So we just wanted to bring that up. It's an interesting situation. You've got an allowable density today, which is greater than what's on the ground in most cases. In the comprehensive plan, before we created this new chapter 18, there was a term, um, if you were within the mixed use overlay, as Irene just said, like in this yellowish area or the red area, you could do up to 15 units per acre if you were a mixed use project. Now, if I got five acres, my mixed use project may look very different than I've got a 50 by 100 foot lot. You see what I'm saying? And it was almost forcing vertically integrated uses. Um, and it was restricting or it was requiring residential between 20 and 80 percent. And, you know, there were other requirements that was forcing a market that, frankly, doesn't exist in a lot of places. 
So what we have said is we've said, listen, this formulaic approach, the goal behind this is that if we build good form within the city, the idea is that the uses can adapt over time. Our office right now was built in the 20s. It used to have eight residential units in it. It was an apartment building. Now it's our office. Across the street are two bungalows, which is Kibby Wagner, the attorneys. You know, and down the street is Lady Anne's Tea House, you know. And these uses adapt over time. And that's what a mixed use downtown or environment is all about. So we're trying not to get hung up on the uses and get rid of the rules that say that thou shalt have 25% commercial in this mixture. Who's going to enforce that, frankly?